No, I like her. She's eating all my cress. Little wiener. I know. Oh, we got a confrontation coming now. Three ways we can lose water is down, up, and across. So drainage down through your subsoils where we want to maximize water retention capacity of your soil. Across your soil on top of the surface, which is surface water runoff. And then up from the surface, which is evaporation. We want to minimize all three of these sources of water loss. Okay, so now imagine you're a little microscopic piece of life or a tree root that needs oxygen and you're trying to wind your way through all those sponges. You're a lot happier if that water's stored in the sponge. You have access to that water, but you're not being drowned because oxygen can still get down and you can still feed on the oxygen. So this is kind of what um, high organic material soils will do and this is really what biochar uh, exceeds at but also just putting wood chips down and getting that life building in your soil will start building your retention capacity for waters so again when those rains hit they all come into the, your soil and instead of just draining through the subsoils they're actually being held and stored in the giant sponge that's now your living soil and this is why i hammer on all the time grow soil not plants because if you keep with these long vision uh, these long game uh, future forward looking visionary type uh, not visionary but these forward looking strategies long term strategies and you keep building your soils you keep building water retention capacity and more water more life more plants more life more energy more life it's all that snowball that builds and builds and builds. Okay, so now we've talked about a couple ways of mitigating the water out. We've talked about drainage. We've talked about surface runoff. Now let's talk about evaporation. We're gonna minimize the amount of water that once it falls on our soils will evaporate away. That one's really easy and it combines with other stuff that I tell you all the time on this channel, never bare soil. So not only are the wood chips gonna help you with building organic material in your soil. Not only are they gonna help you preventing surface water runoff for your water, they're also gonna help you build um, evaporation resistance. They're gonna stop the sun from hitting your soils. They're gonna shade the soils and um, they're gonna prevent winds from being able to access and dry away all your land. So we also want to be planting in these dense polycultures, not just to maximize photosynthesis, but also the water side of the photosynthesis equation. The more leaves we have, the more shading of the soil level we have, and the more shading of the soil level we have, the less evaporation we have. This maple tree is one of my favorite places on the property, and I made these drip edge gardens around the tree because I wanted to be forced to walk underneath them and have value and use while I'm in here but they're actually showcasing a perfect example for this video right now. And that's that the second I walk under them, like I just walked under, I feel a noticeable temperature change due to the shading. And air will hold various amounts of moisture based on temperature. So when we cool the air around our plants, we actually reduce the amount of moisture that can be held inside of those airs. And moisture will come out of the air and go into the soil. Contrarily, in the hot areas where you get full blazing sun, the, heat, the air heats up, air can have more moisture inside of it, and when winds come pulling across, it can pull and wick away more moisture out of your soils. So keeping areas shaded and nice and cool is vital for maintaining as much moisture in your systems as possible. And 
Um, this is why on my channel often I'll say that all this stuff is so complicated and there's so m many moving parts and you can get overwhelmed by all the science and am I doing stuff right? But when it comes down to it, actually, it's really, really simple. And the main things, sure, there's a lot going on, but the main actions that you should take, they're all the same. Overplant, heavily mulch, and really, when it comes down to it, it can be even simpler than that. It's basically just look at a forest and mimic what a forest does. A forest falls, a forest drops organic material down, a forest doesn't fence life out, a forest allows life in. Just mimic the forest and that is really the only action that you need to take and you'll get fertility. Okay, so now I'm gonna add a little section on miscellaneous uh, tips and tricks that don't fall under those last three categories, um, but they will still help you save water, um, preserve what you have, and just be a little bit smarter about the way that you water. As far as how much to water, if you're gonna manually water, um, you wanna look for signs of distress before you water. So two ways to do that is just to check your soil level, dig back a bit, access the ground, and see how moist it is. That wood chips can be quite dry, but when you get down to the soil level, oh my gosh, I can just stick my hand right in there. When you get down to the soil level, you can kind of feel moisture. This soil has just become so unbelievable. It almost feels like soft, broken up peat moss. It's just insane. So even though it's dry at the top, there's moisture way down there. And this is kind of also what I'm talking about when I talk about um, moisture retention capability in soils is that when the rains come down and try to drain away, the water's held and then it'll evaporate and wick off the surface, but it'll stay deep. It'll stay really deep in your soils. And that forces the trees to actually come and dig way down and drive roots super, super far deep down. That makes the tree stronger. Obviously, designing some kind of water storage is always a good idea. So however that looks, if you can get ponds and water holding bodies into your system, that's amazing. It doesn't have to be a big pond like this. I hand dug a small pond up here that I have some several other videos on um, and I ran my roof water into it so now I've moved my roof water into swales so I capture all my roof water and then I send it and I design my contour so that all water that hits my land you know will make it into various swales I have a swale down here and I also have a swale down there so all the water is going to capture and store and be held on my land. So make sure that you're designing in your rainwater to ignore that. <laughs> it's always funny when I am video, I do my videos and then, you know, I have random stuff out. So my kids left, you know, just dad, dad stuff. My kids left my lawnmower out by the road. So I just wanted to hide it behind trees in here. We're harvesting some of this clover up here to help spread some organic material onto the lawn as the lawn grows. So this clover patch here, we're mowing it and harvesting the leaves and then triggering flush of growth for everything around it and all that sort of stuff. All right, small aside there. So just make sure that you're harvesting every little bit of rain from your lands as you can and stop them from washing away. Ideally, the best place for a pond is as high as possible in your land. So for me, that ideal spot is actually the high point of my land is up here. Now it's right by the road and I would love, love, love to build a pond there. There's other implications I have to think of, legal issues, you know, someone's cat or dog drowning in my pond. So unfortunately, you know, I'm not building a pond up there. I would love to have a pond up there, but I've thought about doing something like a hydraulic ram pump to basically slowly pump, you know, water from my rain catchment up elevation passively 
So there's things like hydraulic ram pumps you can look into. Um, those are super cool. I really like the idea of that kind of stuff. Um, this is just, you know, there's so many things to do and I'm trying to do the easiest things that can get me going and then, you know, I've got my life to add cool little projects like that. So look up hydraulic ram pumps, look up putting various micro ponds in different places where you can capture, store and hold water and capture your rainwater. Every single vertical roof or horizontal roof should lead somewhere that you want it to lead and it should stay on your land for as long as possible. And then work on those other three things. Um, mulched, mulched lands, graded lands, uh, build that organic material in your soils by, you know, composting, getting that uh, nutrient cycling back into your land. That's organic material, getting the life building in your soil, overplant, dense, dense, dense polycultures, and just keep on working towards building a forest. Remember, we're, we're, mimic, we're mimicking what a forest does. So like I said before, um, the, before you go manually, oh, she's eating all my strawberries. So this is another, I guess, uh, the strawberries blooming is a good example. Right now, when strawberries are putting fruit on, um, when a plant is growing fruit, that's when they're going to, that's when the plant is going to be using the most amount of um, water. So tomatoes, strawberries, anything like that is going to be consuming the most amount of water when it's fruiting. So it's important that while it's fruiting, you're supplying it with, you know, a decent amount of water so that it can grow healthy fruit. Often, especially during the day, when a plant is making fruit, it will actually um, display signs of display signs of um, water stress. So this can be, you know, the, the whole curling of the leaves or um, just in generally looking slightly more sad. Double check that the plant doesn't recover and look great um, by nighttime. Don't just water because you see that. Check the soil and check down at soil level for um, signs of really, really dry soil. Um, second thing is know what signs of plants in stress look like. Sorry, for the next little while you're probably gonna see me eating lots of berries. I gotta eat them somehow. So, often signs of water stress in plants can look the same, too much water and too little water. So let's, let's kind of talk about that. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude eating. But I gotta say, I just gotta, I gotta make a break here and say this. Hascaps are probably one of the most underrated berries. When I first had them, I thought, oh, these are a blueberry. Someone sold them to me like a cold-hearted blueberry. Okay, they're not a cold-hearted blueberry. They're, uh, they're very tart. And when I first had them the first year, I thought, oh man, I planted a whole bunch of these stupid Hascap bushes and they're all sour and I, I don't like them. The more that I eat them, there's got to be something in there that just like makes you addicted to them. But they're probably they're, they're one of my favorite berries right now. They're so good, and my whole family just gobbles them down. And they're so prolific that like one bush will have so many has caps on it. And there's there's just like it's this complete full flavor. It's sour, but it's not like puckering sour. It's just got that you know like a little sour candy. Um, I like that it actually isn't super sweet. It's very healthy. I mean, I just, I love these things. I, I just had to, like, I love them so much, I had to stop a watering video to tell you how much I love my hascaps. So if you can grow these, consider them, and understand fully that you'll probably end up liking them more as time goes by. Okay, now that folding up of the leaves, that can be a sign of overwatering and underwatering, unfortunately. Um, Basically, both are the plant trying to get less sunlight. So for um, when the plant's really dry, it folds up its leaves a bit and kind of wilts because it wants to reduce transpiration losses, water transpiring off the leaves. When the plant is under or when the plant has too much water, it does the same thing 
because I think it wants to, I can't remember exactly, I think it wants to reduce the amount of photosynthesis going on, so it's trying to curl up its solar panels. The difference, however, is the texture of the leaves. So if it's wilted and kind of deflated and dry and crusty, then it's underwatered. And you can probably tell, you, you, I mean, you probably know what, if it got too much water, too little water, but you can always check the soil. If it's overwatered, an overwatered plant will be really flimsy and loose. It'll feel almost like it's, like it's disintegrating, like it's disintegrating in a wet way. Like what, I don't know what a good way to, like it's kind of sli slimy, flimsy, and it kind of just feels weak and floppy. So if you see wilted leaves, just check the texture of the leaves to see if it's, you know, crusty or floppy. And then you want to look at the color of the leaves as well. If you have a little bit of yellowing, it could just be a natural part of the plant's life cycle. It could be um, a nutritional deficiency. If you see an overall plant yellowing, especially from the tip back, from the tip of the leaves back on the entire plant, then that can be a sign of actually no oxygen getting to the plant, um, which can be a sign that you're flooding it and you're drowning the plant. So if you have a, a plant that looks super, super yellow, then um, that could be your sign that you're overwatering. Okay, and last thing, if you haven't bought a place yet and you're looking, one of the most important things that you can find on a property that might take it to, you know, this is my dream property, is if you can find something like this. This is a corkscrew willow, for example, that I planted down in here. Every plant, every green plant back in there is poison ivy, so that's, fun but I do have a free water source so if you can get um, a piece of property that has free running water on it that runs like all year round winter right through the winter time so I have that option of tapping into that free water um, if I need to, I'd have to go through poison ivy. There's areas that I can get at it that aren't poison ivy, but not too many. But it's still very valuable to have a source of free, fresh flowing water. So if you haven't picked a site yet, that's probably the most important thing for you to look for. Try to find something with free water. All right, so next leveling some watering. This is another way with liquid manures. So I have a video on this that I'll link to right here and this is basically inside a Go Diego Go pillow is all my comfrey plants that I cut up and dig from around the garden and then I have an aerator right here that is pushing air into my this is a very serious aerator because it's for the pond but it's pushing air into the comfrey liquid manure and that gets it uh, aerobic, so we're trying to multiply beneficial bacteria in this. Not just nutrient, but beneficial bacteria. I've got my hose going in right now to help dilute it. I'm not super picky about it because I'm going to be watering trees and everything. And now I'm going to got drop a sump pump in there for now. Later on I'd like to you know, have a faucet and a tap and I can direct everything better. Um, with no energy, but for now I have an electric sump pump and I'm going to water some of these pond plants because it's not going to rain for maybe two weeks and then I will run the hose, it'll dilute it a bit more and then we will water the garden which is coming along decently or not the garden, sorry, the lawn that's a clover grass polyculture mix lawn and I better get going because it's about to overflow Now this is actually my lunch break at work, so we're middle of the day right now. Um, comfrey tea can be used as a foliar feed as well for plants. It helps the plants get the water a little faster right into the uh, cell walls of the plant and uh, gives them a little gives them a little boost. You can do this around fruiting time because. While it does have nitrogen, it actually has quite a bit of potassium and phosphorus as well, which will help with fruiting. 
typically around leafing time you don't want to give it a super super heavy nitrogen spray because it'll promote the plant to make more leaves instead of fruit but these are just baby plants right now anyway so I'm just giving them a, a nice little nutrient boost giving the soil a nice little nutrient boost look at this guy telling me not to water my leaves to water at the ground and he's spraying his tree so this is midday it's gonna evaporate away and this is as much of a life inoculation as it is a nutrient boost but again the, the water is going to evaporate away and the uh, the timing is important as well so we're doing this just before fruiting just during fruit set and before fruiting when trees want tons and tons of water and also where they are starving for as much nutrients and uh, minerals as they can get. So this is a bioavailable nutrient natural organic fertilizer. Now I didn't do this last year. Last year I kind of ran a bit of an experiment with if I can go zero water and uh, with the swales and it was very successful. This year um, I am going to take advantage of free water sources that I have, uh, fertility of all the comfrey that I've planted, and I'm going to take advantage of all this. So I'm noticing something about the lawn. Always good to take in the information that the world has given you. You can see how dried and cracked and crappy this is because, you know, I've been putting some grass down. Um, ideally, I would probably have mulched this with hay. I don't really care. It's just grass lawn, so I'm not going to fuss over it. And the clover will come up. It's mostly the shade right now. So the clover's coming up. It'll come up and fix everything. But the power of water retention in your soils, the power of shading your soils, look how progressively better this stuff gets. It's harder to get out here with the hose, so we actually water this less than more. And you can see that it almost, you know, follows the reach of the tree. So there's a tree to the south of this patch, and you can see how much better a little bit of soil, a little bit of thermal moderation will do. Sorry, it's probably really windy. But you can see the power of shade and thermal moderation and even just having little baby grasslings grow, grass seedlings grow. All right, so that's it. Thanks for watching my water guide. This is one of those topics that I could make like 10 hour long videos on. And no matter how I do this, I'm always thinking of, oh man, I wish I said this or that or this or that. So I tried to get an another couple concepts in here. Biochar is a big one. Contouring with swales uh, and terraces. That kind of thing, that's another one. Um, property selection, getting a, a nice source of water. Rainwater capture, building storage like ponds. Deep mulch, dense polycultures to maximize shade at the soil and minimize wind. Um, and then building that organic matter in your soil. I think if you do those things, it won't matter how much you water because every time it rains, you're capturing and holding so much of it your sponge in your soil is so big that one good solid rain can last you months. So definitely work on building up that retention in your soil and capture and hold every drop that wants to fall on your land. And I want to leave you with one thing. There was one overall concept that I didn't mention that is pervasive through my whole strategy here. And can anyone guess what it is? I'm going to leave you for a second and think. There's one reason that ties all of this together. Try to think about what it is. And you can watch the waterfalls. Three seconds. Two, one. Rain and nitrogen. The reason why that ties all these concepts together is that there is a big, big difference between rainwater feeding your trees and city water or even well water or even 
pond water less so because it's very nutrient rich. But your city water um, has been sitting inside pipes, it's gone through pumps, it has been completely de, de aerated. In fact, um, part of the process in water treatment facilities in the city um, puts them through different stages. There's, you know, it's a, actually a very complicated process um, where uh, airs are actually removed from, gases are removed from the water. And then treatments are added as well, like fluorine and stuff like that, chlorine. Um, however, the big thing is that when rain falls down through the atmosphere, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. Plants use nitrogen to build leaves. So when water is misted, aerosoled, and falls in raindrops down through a nitrogen-heavy um, environment, it actually will pick up part of those gases and entrain them inside the water drops. In fact, in industrial processes, we use stuff called a de-aerator, where we actually spray water out of a nozzle to get to atomize it and get those gases back out. But when raindrops form in the air and form into bigger raindrops when they fall, kind of the opposite happens. It'll fall down through as a, you know, a small drop but a fairly large piece of water that can actually hold nitrogen gas as it comes down. It'll scrub out that nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and hit the ground. When it hits the ground, it splashes and that aerosol effect happens and the nitrogen comes out. Some of it goes back into the atmosphere, but some goes into the soil. Some goes down into your wood chips. When that raindrop comes down, it's carrying nitrogen. So not only is rainwater just cleaner and more pure than, you know, city added water, but it also comes with the side benefit that it scrubbed nitrogen out of the atmosphere and brought it down. So that's why it's really important that the rainwater especially that falls down on your property that you keep and hold and store that. So that was actually the overarching um, concept in the background of all these things that I didn't even mention is that the whole thing was about maximizing and holding specifically rainwater, stopping it from running off your land, stop it from it draining down through your land and stop it from evaporating back into the soil or into the atmosphere. So thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.